Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that most Americans now think it's okay to tinker with your genes, that is, if it's done in the interest of human health. The Pew Research Center just conducted a poll and found most Americans are okay with genetic engineering for many types of animals and humans if it's going to prevent a disease or it's going to make us healthy. And most Americans even think it's okay to tweak a baby's genes, but not to make the baby stronger, smarter, or faster, but only to prevent disease. Uh, I, I don't quite understand that entire mindset there, but people now say 70% of people uh, are okay with preventing the spread of disease by reducing mosquitoes' fertility. And can I just say, this isn't in the study, but can we just get rid of those little bastards? They're just not worth it. All right, sorry, I had to say that. And 57% of people are on board with engineering animals to be organ donors for humans. Apparently, they haven't heard about stem cells yet. And a majority of respondents drew the line at tweaking an animal to produce more nutritious meat or bringing back animals from extinction, presumably because they all saw Jurassic Park. And of that group, 18% said species are extinct for a reason, as in they deserved it, not because we did it to them. 23% said it, quote, messes with nature or God's plan. And 14% said it's a waste of resources. And only 4% of people said they were afraid it would create a Jurassic Park scenario in which the de-extinct animals would run amok and kill people. Well, I got to say, maybe it's time for us all to do a little bit of thinking about the world we want to build because we are building a different world right now. And if we can either do it consciously or we can do it without conscience, and I can tell you what happens when you do things without being conscious of what you're doing or thinking ahead. And usually, it's not better than it was before. Today's guest actually has nothing to do with Jurassic Park or dinosaurs. I know I'm tricking you guys with my incredible art of foreshadowing in my, in my show notes. Uh, but he actually has helped to take an almost extinct philosophy and reinvigorate it and introduce it into the wild. And that philosophy is called Stoicism. I'm talking about none other than Ryan Holiday, who is a fantastic author. And as an author, I mean, I have a lot of authors on here. I got to tell you, Ryan's head and shoulders are just, just seriously good writing. I, I don't miss any of his books, uh, including ones you might not have heard of that I'm going to tell you about. Uh, you might have seen Ego is the Enemy, The Obstacle is the Way, Trust Me, I'm Lying, uh, or the one that you should read called Perennial Seller. And he discusses complex ideas that are, are very, very approachable. And you might have seen Conspiracy, his latest book, where he actually dug deep with uh, Peter Thiel and Gawker and what happened to, to get Gawker shut down with Hulk Hogan and all, uh, which is just an eye-opening book and has this amazing power, which I think he got from Robert Greene, uh, the guy who wrote 48 Laws of Power, to just look in and digest things. He's one of those guys I truly respect. I was super excited to get him on the show. Ryan, welcome. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. What did you think of that intro? Not like one you've was, had before, right? It, it was it was very kind. It was very <laughs> kind. I appreciate it. Uh, it's uh, it's all real. And <laughs> uh, man, there's so much that we're going to get to talk about today uh, that's, uh, that's super cool. You started in your professional career when you dropped out of college at age 19 uh, from the University of California. And what did you do when you were 19? Well, I, I had this opportunity to to be a research assistant for Robert Greene, uh, which, which as someone who wanted to be a writer, was sort of, uh, you know, it, to me it was the it was the equivalent of being drafted, uh, you know, f out of college and, and and getting to leave and going straight straight into the pros. I worked for another author who who I know you know Tucker Max, um, and then I also had a job at a talent agency. So I sort of had these three opportunities, and it, it struck me one day that being able to do any three of them after college would have made college a success. So what the hell was I staying in? What was I saying no to these things for to stay in school to hopefully get them to come back around, uh, you know, after I'd walked across the stage at graduation? It's an unusual amount of wisdom for a 19-year-old. I, I had a similar situation. I could have dropped out of college uh, when I was about 19, actually, maybe 20. And been one of the co-founders of a company called Net Creations that sold three years later for $250 million uh, to one of the big internet ad companies. 
And I didn't do it because I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to get my degree. So you basically had something already in your mind or your psychology that said, I'm going to make that decision based on those things. Is that because you were pissed off at the world because you had good parents? What, what made you make that unusual call? Well, my, my parents thought it was a terrible idea. Uh, so so I, can't, I can't give them credit. Um, and, and it wasn't nearly as compelling as, you know, working at a company that was going to sell for, for $200 million. I, I remember when at the talent agency, which was really sort of the only paid position uh, or of any of any seriousness, the salary was $30,000. And I, I remember thinking, what am I going to do with all this money? Uh, you know, I ju- it just sounded like so much to a college student. But really, really, I think what I was attracted to was just the idea of getting to do the work that I was reading about. Like I, I, I read all of Robert Greene's books and I thought he was this amazing writer. The idea that I could work for him and that that might be a shortcut to where I wanted to end up, which was to write my own books. To me, the idea of of passing that, passing on that to, to sit in a classroom uh, and listen to a less successful writer tell me about how to be a writer just didn't make any sense. <laughs> Got it. So you're pretty rational about the whole thing. Uh, and well, I, it, was, Green- it was ter- it was terrifying. I mean, I'm, I'm rational about it more in retrospect. I think there's probably some gut instincts there, but it was also certainly terrifying at the time. I mean, especially with my parents, you know, basically saying that I was, you know, throwing my life away. Uh, parents are uh, they'll often do that. I think if I'd have quit, I would have had the same conversation with mine. And having had Robert Green on the show a while back as well, uh, that book that you did the research for, Forty Eight Laws of Power. I made six million dollars because of that book. Wow! Uh, I lost it when I was twenty-eight uh, because I didn't read the rest of the book, apparently. But but in all seriousness, I did not understand the power dynamics of boardrooms as a twenty-six-year-old arrogant engineer. And I read that book over a weekend, and I came back into work. I'm like, oh my god, these executives aren't nuts. And and sure. you did the research for that book, so I I thanked Robert. I'm thanking you for that too. <laughs> well, no, look, as much as I would love to take credit for doing the research on that book, I, I think I was. I think I was in seventh grade when the 48 Laws oh, of Power came well, out. Oh, crap. I thought that was the one you worked on. In that case, screw no. you, man. No, <laughs> well, so, but so, so I think part of the reason that I dropped out was having read that book. You know, he talks uh, about the idea of, of sometimes acting before you're ready. It, 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 it's sort of this master class of, of wisdom. And so I think if I was ahead of my age at that time, it was largely because of what I'd read from him. And then I, I was lucky enough to be the research on a book he wrote called The 50th Law. And then he wrote a book called Mastery, which I was the research assistant on. So. Uh, both both excellent books. Uh, Mastery in particular stands out. But along the way, you became a stoic and, and you're a deep researcher. Um, there, there's a certain kind of mind uh, that's relatively unusual. You know, people just dig into stuff and, and really build a super complex model of it. Uh, and somewhere along the way, you picked up the stoic mindset, I'm guessing, in some of your research on these things. When and how did you become a stoic? Yeah, I, I had I'd read some Stoic philosophy in college, and then certainly dropping out was probably the m- most trying thing that I'd gone through at that point in my life. And so, you know, we, we tend to think of philosophy as being this academic discipline, just in the way that we tend to think scientific research is only to be done by the professionals. Um, but it, it the irony is that the professionals tend to come up with the least practical uses for <laughs> that research. And that sometimes I think it falls on sort of real ordinary people to, to do that experimentation. And what I loved about stoicism was that, you know, here were real people talking about real problems, right? When you when you read Marcus Aurelius, he's talking about managing your temper or your fear of death, or he's talking about uh, the idea of, of, of why you should be a good person. You know, again, he's not talking about it theoretically. He's talking about it as this man who who is the most powerful man in the world at that time. He's the head of the, the Roman Empire. Um, and he's just struggling with the stresses and difficulties of political life uh, and, and ordinary life. And so I think what hit me about Stoicism was was just how practical and useful it was and and how different it was than anything that I had, I'd read or, or talked about in college. You know, um, there are all these interesting questions that philosophers can ask, you know, like the, the popular one today is like, how do we know we're not living in a computer simulation or not? And I think that's really intellectually fascinating, but that doesn't change, you know, what you should do when you wake up in the morning or or how you would uh, talk to someone or how you would deal with fear or worry. And stoicism to me is all about those practical questions. And so I think I was looking for answers and 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 that's what it provided. 
A lot of people by now have heard about stoicism. In fact, the New York Times says that it's uh, it's basically you're one of the big people who caused the resurgence in popularity. But I think a lot of people have a very mushy idea yeah. of what stoicism is. Can you define it in a crisp way for us? Totally. People, people, when people hear stoicism, they think lowercase stoicism, which means like has no emotions. Like I, he was very stoic about it, which means he just sort of he or she just sort of took it. And that's really not what Stoicism is. Stoicism is a philosophy, um, like a, like Buddhism, uh, let's say. And, and to me, the, the, my definition of Stoicism, what I sort of give to people, is that uh, uh, the Stoic believes that they don't control the world around them, but they control how they respond. So they control what they're going to do. And it, so it's this sort of formula for responding and responding well. You know, the Stoics would say that we should we should react to everything with temperance, and wisdom and courage, um, and and if we can respond in those ways, and the, the fr- it's a framework for responding in those ways, we're going to have a good life. We're going to have a happy life, and we're going to be able to deal with what life throws at us. Uh, when you read some of the the older uh, just writings on stoicism, and I'm not anywhere nearly as well studied as you are on it, uh, there seems to be this this vibe of look, you may not have health, you may not have wealth. Uh, but how you respond to all of those things is is really up to you. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you're a successful entrepreneur. Uh, you know, you have health and you pay attention to it. You have wealth and you pay attention to it. How is uh, focusing or allowing or or bringing that stuff into your life? How is that that a part of the Stoic philosophy? Yeah, th- that is the interesting. That is the interesting question. Well, so one, we should realize that the Stoics lived, the, the Romans lived in a much more hierarchical, rigid world than we live in now. So your role was much more defined. But but I I think the philosophy very much works in the modern day. And the, the, you know, Seneca was saying, uh, who, who is another prominent Stoic, he would say that wealth and health and fame and uh, respect, all, all these things. He would sort of call them preferred indifference. So if you're not healthy, uh, you would deal with it as a Stoic. If you are healthy, uh, you would appreciate it and take advantage of it. He's saying, you know, look, um, it's better to be tall than short. But if you're short, you're short. So so there there is that sort of spin on things. But then, you know, Marcus Aurelius had the most famous doctor in, in Roman times, a guy named Galen. Clearly, Galen's job was not to keep Marcus from not getting well, right? Marcus listened to the advice of his doctor. He he tried to be healthy. He tried to take care of himself. He didn't sit around on a couch gorging himself. So what the Stoic is really talking, uh, this idea of, of making a distinction between what's in your control and what's outside your control is really the important thing. So what you eat is in your control. How tall you are maybe is less in your control. What color hair you have is less, you know, you're, what you're born with is, is not in your control. But whether you exercise, whether you decide to pick up a book and better yourself, you know, a, a, whole, a whole bunch of these things that maybe uh, certain people pretend are not uh, up to them, that they don't have any agency about. And in fact, we do have a lot of agency over. And I think the Stoics would embrace that agency. And, and clearly, you know, your work has been sort of at pushing and expanding the margins about where we can influence, uh, where we can influence those things that, you know, up until a few years ago, people thought were, were not up to them. So maybe we have more agency than we thought. Yes. And if we, and if we have agency, then the Stoics say we should put all our energy into using that agency. Uh, see that that's the part of stoicism that I think is missing from the big conversations that if you have agency, you owe it to yourself or to the world, or just basically that the right thing to do is to use the agency. Um, if you have it, that that's right. I mean, if there's a, a 99% chance that something is impossible, I think the stoic would focus on the, on the fact that there's a 1% chance that it is possible. Um, but if it's impossible, they're not going to hurl themselves against some brick wall over and over again, um, and they're not going to complain about it and whine about it. They're going to <laughs> they're going to say, "Hey, maybe we try to go in a different direction instead of continuing to throw ourselves in front of this wall, or you know, instead of sitting down and pretending that it that it's hopeless and helpless." All right, that is uh, that is very meaningful. So then, stoicism is 
totally cool with living beyond 180 years. <laughs> well, you know, the Stoics do, <laughs> the, the Stoics do talk a lot about mortality, um, and we should remember that uh, they were dealing in a world, they were living in a world that's much more fragile than our world. Yeah. Um, you know, Marcus Aurelius saw two different plagues come through Rome uh, during his own lifetime. So naturally, uh, they are going to have a slightly different relationship with death than we are. But I still think a lot, I, I think if it is in your control to help yourself live longer, um, you should take advantage of that. It, you know, if a Stoic was looking at the research that said, hey, smoking causes cancer and reduces uh, life expectancy, I'm not sure they would say, oh, you should continue smoking because uh, just trying to live longer is, is, is a stupid thing to do. But I think where the Stoics sort of, you know, the idea of memento mori, sort of meditating on your mortality, being aware of, 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 of the reality of death and, and that death gives us, gives life meaning. I think it's still, you know, if, if, if all your research turns out to be true and, and you are on track to live to be 170, that's not going to help you if you get hit by a bus crossing the street, <laughs> right? So, so the idea that, hey, you know, I think some people, the scientifically minded people can take the wrong lesson from their research, which is, you know, if, if you think doing this work is going to give you 100 years of extra life expectancy, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't excuse you from taking advantage of every moment that's in front of you right now. You still, I, I think the Stoics would still say, whether you live to be 70 or 700, you, all you possess for sure is the present moment, and you should, you should seize it as much as possible. Uh, so that that matches uh, where where my mind is. Where I'm planning to live to at least 180, uh, and I'm completely happy to die trying. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know. But sure. if, but if if I'm not happy along the way, screw that noise. If all I get to eat is kale, um, I'd rather die. Se you know, Se Seneca talks about you know he's saying don't live um, every day as if it's your last. Right. Because if if yeah. today's the last day of, you know, you're not going to eat well, you're going to go join an orgy somewhere, you know, you're going to relax all your standards of discipline and et cetera. He's saying you should live each day as if it could be your last one. So he's saying you should sort of balance the books every day, leave nothing unfinished, don't defer anything to the future. But at the same time, don't assume that there is no future because there very well may be one. So then... Let's talk about ego because okay. ego comes into that a lot. And you did write, you know, that little book about ego, uh, yes. which I, I texted you. Actually, uh, my wife absolutely just adores uh, ego. Oh. Uh, ego is the enemy, and uh, it is really um, it just a, a big. Uh, it just she was like, Dave, this book is so good. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what's what's your definition of ego, and how does it fit into the stoic uh, the stoic mindset? One of my favorite quotes uh, from the Stoics about ego comes from Epictetus, and he says, uh, it's impossible to learn that which you think you already know. And I think that that's a, a pretty great definition of, of ego. If you think you've mastered something, if you think you know it all, in a way you're right, because you're not going to learn anything else. And so I make a big distinction in the book between confidence and ego. I think confidence is really important. I think ego is really dangerous. Confidence is based on evidence. Ego is based on delusion, um, self-absorption. It's an ignorance of our strengths. And so it, it, it's, it's really important that we, we are confident. If you don't believe you can do something, you can't do it. But just because you believe something does not at all mean that you can do it. Uh, got it. means you're at least willing to give it a shot and see yes. what happens. Yes. Uh, but also, if you believe you can live, if you jump off a tall building, right. uh, well, <laughs> it might right. not work out the way you want. Yeah. Or, 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 yeah, if you believe you're invincible, that doesn't make you invincible. But if you believe that you're, if you have evidence that, you know, you're strong, you persevere through difficulty, you don't quit, you know, that's, that's going to give you evidence that you can extrapolate out and make decisions based on, you know, David and Goliath, you know, on the, Goliath is egotistical. He thinks that he's unbeatable. Uh, David, um, is confident because, uh, you know, he, he was a shepherd, but he remembers that he's fought off bears and lions. This is what he says in the story. You know, I fought off bears and lions with my bare hands. Like, I'm not going to shy away from anything. And he also knew that he'd come up with an advantage, right? He had, he had figured out that the, 
that the sling and the stone would be an advantage uh, at a distance against Goliath. So it, you know, go, again, Goliath is egotistical because he thinks he can do anything. David is aware that he has both weaknesses and strengths, and ultimately that's a much stronger combination. Got it. So, so that that fits into that that definition of ego. When someone is practicing stoicism, and I'm getting into some of the personal development work sure. uh, that that I do, some of the neuroscience and all. Um, there's a set of emotions you have. So you're facing, you know, Goliath or a tiger or a bear or a big entrepreneurial challenge. Um, and, and you, you feel uncertainty, fear, uh, terror, you know, fear of failure, whatever is going on in, in your mind, or at least in your emotions. Right. Um, and then a stoic to say, well, I felt all this stuff, but I'm going to act with integrity. I'm going to behave a certain way, even though I, I kind of took the hit of feeling the feelings on that. Yeah. Um, how does ego tie into those feelings versus the behavior? Like, like where does ego insert itself in, in that, that order of operations? That's a great question. I mean, I think, you know, the, the common definition of stoicism would be like, it just stuffs all those emotions down. It pretend, right. pretends they don't exist. I actually don't think that's what a stoic is doing. I think, you know, a stoic isn't not processing their emotions. A stoic is processing their emotions. So a stoic says, I'm feeling anger about this. Why am I feeling that anger? Is it constructive to feel this anger? If I give in to this anger, what will happen? And I think the same would be true for, you know, desire or temptations or fear or worry. Um, you know, Marcus really has this great line. He says, like, if it's endurable, endure it. And if it's not endurable, then basically it's going to go away because it's either going to kill you or it's going to end. Right. And so so there's this sort of logical processing of what happens. And then where I think ego comes in, ego is in a weird way, there's nobody more in touch and less in touch with their emotions than an egotistical person, right? Like an egotistical person is often driven by like a very profound and deep insecurity uh, yep. and, and a fragility, like they've been hurt before or they don't feel good about themselves or whatever it is. And so ego is this defense mechanism that they carry around, this sort of armor that they wear. And then the irony is they go around reacting to things because of that insecurity, but they have no idea that's what they're doing, right? So um, e egotistical people are constantly feeling threatened and then reacting, but but they can't admit why they feel threatened. So there's this sort of emotional blindness to what's happened. So I think it's better to be, to be aware of the emotions that we have, to process them and work through them, and to just separate out the... Um, the uncomfort, sorry, the unproductive from the productive or the constructive from the unconstructive. And so, you know, fear, if it's helping um, generate prudence, is probably constructive. Fear, if it's paralyzing you or if it's irrational fear, is not going to be constructive. And so we sort of want to work through what we're feeling and why. How do you know when to say no? Because you've got the stoic, rational mindset, and you've got the emotional stuff that's going on. And I, I deal with entrepreneurs. By the way, this is a plug, but uh, my new book called Game Changers, the first rule in this book, which is styled after 48 Laws of Power, um, with full credit to uh, <laughs> Robert for figuring that out. Uh, but it, it's focus on your strength, the power of no. And mm -hmm. like, this has been a big thing in my growth as an entrepreneur. It's like, do I, what deals that are awesome do I say no to? And is it FOMO you know, if you're missing sure. out? Or is it not? Walk me through your ego mindset and your stoic mindset on how you say no. Yeah, that's great. I mean, you know, ego is going to say yes to everything uh, yeah. because it can't say no. It, it fears missing out. Ego is also going to say yes to more than it can possibly do. That's the really mm -hmm. danger. It's going to eventually overreach. Um, and then also ego is so easily gratified and needs to be validated that it's going to say yes to things because it thinks that these are making it better, more important, more wanted, more loved, whatever. I think what a stoic, uh, a stoic would look at is, you know, first off, uh, given the finiteness of life, is this worth spending some of that life on? Right. Uh, Seneca talks about how, you know, if your neighbor would if your neighbor moved their fence to encroach on your land, you would immediately object and say, hey, you can't steal that from me. But if your neighbor came over and wasted a bunch of your time with an inane conversation, you would have such difficulty saying like, no, I don't want to do this or no, I have to go. Right. So it's, it's funny how often 
you know, we'll, we waste, we, we, we are precious with our money and then we are incredibly, not generous is the wrong word, we're incredibly wasteful, wasteful with, with our time. And that's the one resource that we can't get back. And, you know, research aside, it's the one thing we, we can't for sure make more of, right? Right. And, and so I think no is going to be incredibly important. And when you have a strong sense of who you are and what you're doing, um, then, it's, then, then you know what to do. I mean, I, I was reading that, that biography of Evan Spiegel, the founder of Snapchat, and he was saying, you know, the best thing that can happen to an entrepreneur is to have someone come along and offer you a lot of money to buy what you're doing from you. Because in that moment, you have clarity about whether you want to keep doing this or not. So if you if you want to if you'll turn down a lot of money to keep doing something, it's obviously very important. And if you'll take money to not do it, it's probably saying that it's not that important to you. And so you know, when you know what when you know what you value and what's meaningful to you, I think it makes it easier to to say no and to do so more confidently. Uh, that is a uh, that's a very interesting point. So if uh, this goes to the the companies uh, who I think Zappos pioneered this idea. Hey, we'll pay you five grand to quit. Yeah, All right. I I love that mindset, and I haven't done that at Bulletproof, but. Uh, uh, I don't think anyone would quit anyway. <laughs> we have a lot of mission-driven people, so it, it probably wouldn't work at this stage of the company anyway. Although I think about that with my books. You know, if 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 you're writing a book to get rich, you're there's way easier ways to make money, right? Oh, th- thank you for saying that. Okay, I don't know how many people read Perennial Seller, which is one of the books that you wrote, and... It, uh, I'm guessing it wasn't one of your best-selling books. No, I, I mean it's it's sold well, but not not no. not by any so, means. Yes. So here's the deal. I'm just going to say this, and you know, I, uh, you and I have no financial reason or any other deal for me to say this, but for people listening, if you want to write a kick-ass book, you want to start a company that will change the world, you want to do something that actually matters, you have to read Perennial Seller because, uh, Ryan, you capture the, the mindset in that book of of the amount of just effort and passion that goes into writing a book that's worth reading versus writing a book to get to get quick or writing a book in you know five minutes and you know yeah just cranking some shit out so that you can have you know your name an amazon bestseller in the you know third century uh third century middle eastern studies or some (laughs) category where there's no books anyway right right um but to actually make something that's worth someone's time to read um no one in any book or any format has captured the amount of uh just guts that goes into doing that in the way you have in that book. So serious plug, perennial seller, you want to do something massive. This book, like you nailed it. I I read that book. I was like, good God. Uh, I wasn't sure why you wrote the book because I'm not sure how many people are ready for that, but it, man, anyway, that really impressed the hell out of me. Well, thank you. And and look, I think, I think it is, it, it is important. It's like, look, the reason Amazon and Zappos will pay you to quit is that if you take the money, you're not in it for the right reasons. You're not in it for the long haul. And starting a company or writing a book or writing a screenplay, these things are really, really hard. Uh, yeah. e- Elon Musk said that starting a company was like eating glass. Uh, and, <laughs> and, 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 uh, and I think he said, and staring into the abyss of death. And uh, it's partly true. So if you're going to do that, it should be for a meaningful reason and it should have some chance of lasting. Like it just kills me when... I see someone spend so much of their time, which again, they will not get back writing a book that writing a book or starting a company, you know, that that's the equivalent of fidget spinners, just a fad that's, you know, going to disappear. It's, it's like, why, why it makes me really sad. I, I haven't seen anyone who explained it that well. In fact, when I read that, I was like, God, yeah, like this is what happens, um, with writing something that's worth someone's time. And if you're going to sell a million copies of a book that takes you know five hours to read, you just burn five million hours of human lifetime. Sure. I uh, think about you're that. kind of a mass murderer yeah. if you wasted their time. I, I mean, that's just how it works. Well, and, and how much stuff has an expiration date on it unnecessarily, right? So you're selling food products, of course, it expires. But why would you get someone to read a book that like if you're going to burn five million hours of, of people's time, that hour or those hours should stay with them. It should provide some lessons or values that uh, and, and that's why I think, you know, the 48 Laws of Power is such a great book. It's like 
that book will still be read in 100 years or 500 years because he captured something timeless. You know, Jeff Bezos talks about focusing on the things that don't change. And I think whatever you're making, whatever you're selling, the more it's rooted in stuff that doesn't change, the better a chance it has at enduring and lasting because it's solving some, you know, writing a book about how to deal with the Y2K crisis, you know, it had that has an artificial expiration date on it. And, and I think you ultimately regret that. I don't know. It, it's going to come up again for the Y10K crisis. You just give it enough time, man. It's, it's coming back. Yeah, you can redo it. <laughs> I mean, you know, Ga- <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Guy, Guy Kawasaki, whose work I'm a big fan of, you know, he wrote this book called Enchantment, which has done really well yeah. as a perennial seller. And that enchantment is this perennial thing. And on the other hand, he wrote a book called What the Plus, which was a guide to using Google Plus. And so, you know, in, <laughs> in five or 10 years, which of those is going to continue to endure? I think Wait, people. What's, what's Google Plus? Exa- exactly. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Sorry. No, exactly. And, and so, um, you know, the, the more you can root it in things that the reason we still watch Star Wars is that Star Wars is the same sort of hero's journey as uh, the Odyssey or the Iliad or, or any of the other classic tales. And so, um, again, you want to root what you're doing and what, what lasts and what. You know, the Bulletproof, it's the the ritual of morning coffee is about one of the most enduring uh, sort of parts of, uh, of, of human civilization for, you know, five or six hundred years now. Like that is the that is the, per, the the only thing better than the morning coffee ritual, I think, would have been if you'd uh, if you'd written like what to expect when you're expecting, you know, like it's just it's just a timeless perennial thing. It, it, believe it or not, my first book was on human fertility and I was so pissed off about what to expect when you're expecting because it's so wrong that I wanted to call the book How to Expect More When You're Expecting. Ooh, that's a nice little po- oh, that's a nice little play. Uh, but my publisher wouldn't let me. Uh, uh, but but anyway, uh, it's funny you said that because I was like, what would have the most leverage Yeah, uh, writing the Bulletproof Diet or that? And I can tell you, there's a few thousand babies that exist today because of that book who would not have been born. There you go. And I, like, that's impact, right? Totally. Um, but it wasn't a bestseller, but it wasn't about that really. It was like, somebody has to write this. Uh, so it, I love that you picked that example, uh, uh, be, because it, that's bothered me forever. Um, but you, you've done something new in your writing. I, I want to, I want to pick your brain about, um, you wrote a book called conspiracy, which I think is your most recent book, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And you took a, a modern blip many people are aware that Hulk Hogan, sued Gawker and basically put him out of business and that it was funded secretly in a conspiracy by Peter Thiel, who was pissed off at Gawker for justifiable reasons. And what you did, though, is you covered a topical event, which would have met your definition of the book on Google+, but you framed it in as, as a working example of conspiracy, which is something that goes back for thousands of years. And you explained the mindset of conspirators and you went through history and all that. Uh, which was, uh, I think, a creative way to sell a book and very topical. And it's actually what made me want to read it. Like, I, I want to know what's going on because I, I met Peter Thiel. And um, in fact, when I first met him, I'm like, hey, you need to use my biohacking laser on uh, you know, on, on your jaw here, man. Uh, so like we, it was, it was a fascinating meeting of a very unusual human being. And you clearly know him better than I do. But um, I just, uh, the idea that you got access to those people, you dug inside their minds uh, but you tied it back to history. So I think that is another book that'll stand even when no one knows what Gawker was 10 years from now, um, that you'll be able to read that and say, this is what happens. Uh, why did you decide to do it that way in that book? I, I actually thought about exactly what you're saying, which is, okay. which is you know, in, in five years, b- by nature of destroying Gawker, he's rendered it irrelevant, right? Like he won mm-hmm. so decisively and definitively that in five or six years, no... First off, most people in America have never even heard of Gawker because it was this sort of New York Silicon Valley powerhouse that didn't have a lot of sort of flyover audience. But I I think the idea was this thing is gone. How can how can this book continue to be relevant in the future? And and that was really important to me. If I'm going to spend time writing about this book, I don't want it to be merely journalism. Like, I don't just want to record a bunch of facts. I want to show people why these facts matter. And I want these facts to have um, relevance over the long term. I mean, what I love about ancient history is like, I have a book on my shelf over here that's 
Cicero's murder trials and Cic- their Cicero's arguments when he was a lawyer try, you know, defending uh, people uh, against murder charges. And so all the details have fallen away. We don't even necessarily know the names of all the people involved or what exactly they did or when they did it. Um, but it's still incredibly compelling. And so, you know, I just love things that have that endure that way. I, I guess ever since I was a kid, I just love sort of epic stories and and narratives like that. And And I thought, you know, this idea of a billionaire setting out to destroy a media outlet and then doing so in secret through the legal system, that feels like something that Rockefeller or or Vanderbilt would have done. And so I tried to present it that way. I I thought it was kind of a badass move. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, you know, it, it both writing the book, but also just that, that Peter Thiel did that. He's like, well, I have this money. And, and according to your book and your interviews with him, he was doing it to make the world a better place. He's like, I have the means to do it. And these people are, you know, it, it really Gawker did spread a lot of crap, right? Like they, they were, they were not a source of goodness in the world. Uh, I wouldn't put it anyway. So, um, I, I was like, that's ballsy, but he, he did it, but I gotta know how the heck did you get Hulk Hogan, the founders of Gawker and Peter Thiel to spend enough time with you to write a book. Like that was an epic piece of journalism in and of itself, aside from the analysis on what a conspiracy is. There is to- totally an, amel- an, an element of luck and, you know, right place, right time. But in the fall of 2016, I got w- within a, a, a few weeks of each other, I had gotten an unsolicited email from Peter Thiel about something I'd written. And then an unsolicited email from Nick Denton, who's the founder of Gawker, about something else that I'd written. And it sort of occurred to me that I was probably the only person on the planet talking <laughs> to these sort of two mortal enemies. And, and I wasn't going to let that opportunity go to waste. You know, Peter connected with me because I'd written, uh, you know, if not positively, at least open mindedly about what he'd done. And, and I agree. I, I think it was badass, even if you disagree with what it was, like even if you uh, hate it. It's still badass in the way that, um, you know, an action movie, you're like, hey, that was really dangerous. You shouldn't have done that. But that doesn't mean it wasn't really entertaining and and compelling and, you know, crazy to have done. And so um, I was fascinated from that perspective. And then Nick, Nick was actually a fan of my writings on stoicism. So I was able to sort of parlay this chance encounter with both of them into something. And then once I had once I had both of them on the line, the other one didn't want to stop talking to me because he was he was worried that uh, it would be too one sided. I think and so FOMO. Ex- exactly. And then you know Peter was nice enough to connect me with Hulk Hogan, and then um, because I talked to them, you know, then people on the Gawker side were like, "Well, if we don't talk to this guy, this is going to be totally a pro Peter Thiel narrative, and we don't want that to happen." And so uh, it, it was sort of you know again, this is probably something I learned from Robert playing the two sides off of each other a little bit was was certainly helpful <laughs> I, I was about to say you played 48 yeah. laws right there but you, you you were uh okay that is a cool story i don't know if you ever told it that way but uh it's uh, uh it, it it was amazing when i read it just to imagine this and i got another question okay. for you for selfish reasons uh, you're running brass check and you know, you're advising Google and taser and all these big multi-platinum musicians and, uh, and, and people like that. And you're writing in-depth researched, carefully written quality works. And you have a family, you live on a farm, by the way, I live on a 32 acre organic farm to grow all our own food, have some sheep and pigs and also we, we've got some things I in common. So. There. You do that. Out, you're outside Austin, but how do you find time to write and have a family and still run your company? The the, fam- the family thing is new. My, my son's only about 21 months old, so it's certainly been a balance. Yeah. But, you know, I don't think I could. Writing is such a wonderful profession in that you can kind of do it anywhere and on your own schedule. So, you know, if I was running my own company and I was a stockbroker and I had a family, I'm not sure those three things would mix. You know, writing... You know, I, I got up early this morning and I took my son for a long walk on our farm while my wife slept. And then I handed him off to her. And then I went up and I wrote for two or three hours. And then um, I'll see them again in the afternoon. And then I, I have some, uh, you know, some calls with clients. And then, um, you know, then then in the evening, I might, I might have a few farm chores that I have to do. So it, I think it's about creating a balance. 
But I think one of the things that's really important is what I was saying earlier, which is that you want to have synergy between what you're doing, right? So um, if you're writing books and working with people who are also selling ideas, whether it's in book form or whatever, there's overlap. Or if I'm working with an author client and I learn something, then I can apply it to my own books. If I'm researching something about ancient history, maybe I can come up with a strategy for one of my clients. You know, it's not like you're um, you're writing books uh, that are totally unrelated to what you're an expert about. And so I think I right. think it's important that people find overlap. And, and in a way, each one of the things makes me better. You know, it, I feel like if I didn't have a family, if I was, you know, if I just turned myself into some sort of work machine, I don't think my book, I, that my books would be missing a, a human side or an ability to understand or empathize with, you know, potential readers. And so I think you want to make sure that you're also balanced. And, you know, I think as, as people become more successful, their lives can become less and less normal. And then in a way that messes with the quality of what they're doing because they don't, they don't understand who they're selling to anymore. Yeah, it's different if you're, you know, 45 and you haven't had successful relationships and you have no kids and, you know, you're uh, you know, writing some stuff. It You probably know things because you're an unusual person, but you might not actually have the right thing for people who are you know, in a different phase of life. Yeah. Right. So I, I hear what you're saying there. And, and certainly I've had to do crazy stuff. My kids are uh, nine and 11 now. And over the last, you know, since, since my son was born, I started Bulletproof and you know, I transitioned careers and yeah. wrote all these books and started the radio show and all that uh, and balanced it with being a dad. But that and balanced it with being a dad and a husband has been way more work than I could have ever imagined. And everyone who has kids told me and I didn't believe them. Uh, and I think no, no new parents believe it until it happens. Like, oh my God, but it shifted priorities for me as well. It, it, it definitely shifts your priorities, but I think in a positive way in the sense, n- not just that a family is very rewarding, but like I, you know, we talked about how hard it is to say no. What one of the, it, one of the unsung advantages of having a family, if, if I think if you do it right, is like, I know that I've promised a, a certain amount, if not the majority of my time to my wife and to my family. So if someone comes along and asks me to pick my brain for 15 minutes, if, if I didn't have a strong reason to say no, I think it would be harder for me to say no. So the, the fact that I've sort of pre-sold or pre-committed myself to a family um, allows me to get out of things that I might have been roped into that would have been a complete waste of my time previously. So uh, it, it, it's sort of forced prioritization if you want to be a good father, husband, whatever. So having children and family as a forcing function probably makes you more stoic. Yes, yes. And, and, okay. and, I, and I you that. know, there's nothing more trying and philosophically challenging than, you know, having a, a an infant or a toddler, right? And I, mean, I can only imagine when having a teenager is like, so it, it cha- you know, it challenges you in ways that I think if you can master and get better at, you know, it makes you better at whatever it is that you're doing. Well, mastering the art of, uh, of saying no, uh, there's a reason I put that as my first yeah. rule, because I have the same thing. You probably have a hundred thousand people like to pick your brain for 15 minutes. And certainly I do. And like, it's just not going to happen because that's time I'm going to play with my yeah. kids. Uh, and, and so that, that is that forcing function. Um, at the same time, if you don't say yes to some of those things, you're not going to get the email from Peter sure, Thiel. Sure. You're not going to look at. So, how do you sort through all of the all of your inbound in- inquiries? No, that that's true. There is the the sort of serendipity, the right place. You agree to go to this event, and then so and so's there, and it changed. You 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 do have to say yes, but I think it, it makes. I've tried to be more selective, and I've tried to, you know, I've I've tried to think. Um, where can I cut fat out of some of those experiences, right? So, um, you know, you go to a conference, if you're choosing your own schedule, maybe you get there on Thursday and then you're there first thing Friday morning. And then, you know, you fly out Monday instead of flying out Sunday night, you know, and all of a sudden, a, a maybe 24 hours of meaningful inter- interaction has been expanded to like 
48 or 72 hours. And so I think one of the things that's been beneficial to me having a family is like, it's like, okay, my priority is to be home. I, I'm still, my job is very important to me. My work is still important to me. And by the way, my family depends on those things. So how can I, how can I sort of do that 80-20 test and cut out the unnecessary from the necessary and, and, and get more efficient at what I'm doing? And then um, I actually have, I, I have a friend of mine, um, he's a sports psychologist named Dr. Jonathan Fader. He sent me this photo and it's a photo of, of Oliver Sacks uh, on the phone mm-hmm. on his desk. And you can see he has a big sign in his office that just says no. Uh, and, and so it's like, a, it's a room and he, he said, I, you know, you, I know you have trouble saying no, uh, you should keep this on your desk and you should look at it. And, and I, I do look at it and it, it's just sort of a constant reminder to me that like, you know, is this thing important? Is it going to matter to me in a year in five years and 10 years, you know, just trying to, trying to be a bit more, have a bit bigger perspective on the thing. So, you know, someone who wants to jump on the phone for 15 minutes, um, what is the cost of that? Right. And, and where could I, if I invested those 15 minutes in thinking about a new idea or writing something or sending an email to someone, what's going to have the best ROI for my time? That's sort of how I try to think about it. I I've become, or I've, I've, I've arrived at this, this place in my life where I look at everything I do with an ROI lens or what I put on my plate has an ROI. Yeah the time I spent exercising has an ROI, you know, can exercise more and less time. I'll, I'll take yeah. that. I mean, I started a company doing that, uh, the upgrade labs thing. Uh, and, uh, same thing it, it every little thing at what point, uh, in your experience, do you think that it becomes something like orthorexia or anorexia where you're like, like I, I, I'm so obsessed with having an ROI on everything I do that I didn't have the serendipity or you know, take that email. How do you balance that out? Well, so I, I have an Apple watch just a, as a story. I have an Apple watch. And so, you know, I have my like calorie goal and my exercise goal and, and, uh, my calorie goal is I think a thousand move calories a day. Um, so that's some, it is usually a walk and then some form of strenuous exercise. And so earlier this year, uh, earlier this year, I, I got somehow I had been busy and, and really in a groove. And I, I noticed that I was on like a 14 day streak or something. I'd done it 14 days in a row. And so then on 15 and six, I couldn't stop myself. I kept, I was, you know, I didn't want to break the chain, which is, you know, on the one hand, it's a positive habit that I'm doing it, but I couldn't break the chain. I think 36 days in, uh, I finally said, you know what, this is crazy. I'm going to hurt myself. What am I doing? <laughs> and and the weird thing is stopping on day 36 was actually harder than doing it on day 35, right? And, you know, I, I, the joke I've been saying is like, I didn't, it's not like I got an award for doing 36 days of exercise in a row. In fact, I, I wore my immune system down and I came down with mono. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it, and it <laughs> set me back like, uh, two months almost of, of sort of recovery. And so one of the things that I'm trying to be conscious of is exactly what you're saying, which is that if you're a disciplined person, if you're sort of organizationally focused, if you're incentives driven, um, those, those skills or traits in moderation separate you from the pack and they make you better than other people and they help you get ahead. But if they are done out out of moderation, they can become addictions or even dangerous. You know, Marcus really has talked about this idea of unrestrained moderation. And I, I love that. <laughs> and that's something I, you know, I struggle with. And, you know, when you look at people, you know, Tiger Woods being a great example of someone who overtrained and it, it's taken him in addition to his stuff with his personal life, he he is it's not like Tiger Woods hurt his knees playing golf. He hurt his knees overtraining to be better at golf and thus ended up worse at golf. And so, you know, you can you can definitely suck, not only can you suck the joy and life out of what you're doing if you're too obsessed with optimization, but um, it can be counterproductive at a certain point. It, it can, and, and I'm, I, I don't know if it'll work yet, but I'm just working more on putting some blocks in my calendar. Every day, I've, everything is scheduled because I, Otherwise, uh, you know, I'm probably just gonna yeah. waste it. But now I, I put you know, two or four hour blocks occasionally 
that are uh, they're unplanned. I don't know what I'm going to do here, sort of things. But for me, that's been hard to do because I actually there's a lot of stuff sure. I want to do, it. and so to just be like, so we'll, I'll tell you in another six months if that's a, a good plan or whether they all just get filled up with phone calls anyway, which tends to happen when you're a CEO. My, mine's my, mine's the opposite, which is that like I, I talked to my assistant about I want as few things in my calendar as possible. So I had two things in my calendar. I had this with you, and I had lunch with a friend of mine. You know, yesterday I had one call from my company one consulting session with a client, um, and then Monday, uh, probably something similar. And so the idea being that as a writer, I need uh, as much sort of play time and free time to just be thinking and working. And so if there's something scheduled in my calendar, then my whole day is pivoting around that. Or, you know, I'm thinking, it's like, okay, I have a call at 12, so I have to stop you know, I have to start thinking about it at 1130 and then I have to stop at 1150, you know, so it's, it's, you know, expanding. So my goal is to have as much free time as possible in my calendar. So, and then I have to be disciplined with myself, which is that free time in the calendar means writing, family, or, you know, personal time, nothing else. So that, that's my methodology. You're, you're pretty unusual that way. Uh, I, uh, I I'm pretty far from from that, but I I, I can't. I, that's not accurate. I have a hard time imagining uh, what I would do if I set my calendar up that way. But right now we've got sixty eight million dollars in venture funding, and we're you know, the top selling protein bar in the natural foods channel. And you know the, the company is just it's helping a lot of people. And like I'm all in on that. Uh, but it does mean that I don't have a lot of open blocks to say, you know, what am I going to do today? And something valuable, like, man, that would well, be you, fun. You have a, you have a lot more in the way of sort of daily responsibilities and yeah. uh, obligations. And and frankly, like just hearing that gave me like slightly uh, an anxiety attack. So I've tried, you know, I've <laughs> tried, one of the things I try to say no to are things like that. And And I think, you know, sometimes people, you have to ask yourself like, is is this going to make me happy? So, because I think sometimes people end up pursuing business opportunities or you know speaking opportunities or whatever they are, they pursue them and they don't ask themselves like, what are they going to do if they get it? Right? Like, is is getting it the reward? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Uh, do, do you mean running for president? Is that yes, what you say? That? That, that's such a great example. It's like, <laughs> yeah, he was. If people can get so obsessed with the campaign, they don't realize that the. They haven't seen the before and after pictures of Obama, and, uh, and right. <laughs> seems to take exactly. it out of you. Not a job exactly. I want. <laughs> well, this this has been a fantastic conversation, and I've got another okay. question for you, Ryan. Someone comes to you tomorrow and says, based on everything you know, all you've written, all you've done, what are your three most important pieces of advice for me if I want to perform better at everything I do as a human being? Okay, so I'm going to crib pretty liberally here from the Stoics because they're smarter than me. But I, I'd probably say, number one, focus on what's in your control and ignore what's out of your control. Um, treat obstacles as opportunities to do. So number two would be treat obstacles as opportunities to do things that you couldn't or wouldn't have done before so that you get better when you face adversity or difficulty. And then I think the third one would be make sure that you cultivate moments of stillness and quiet and peace in your life. Because if you don't have them and you're not using them to think big picture, to get in touch with your, you know, your, your, what's important to you, you know, uh, to, to, to think deeply, et cetera, Who's going to do them? Do you know what I mean? Like if you're if you're not if you, Dave, isn't taking a couple hours on a random Wednesday to sit and think about the next big thing, it's not like there's somebody else at Bulletproof who's going to handle that for you. They that's that's your <laughs> job. You know what I mean? That's the, that's your job. job. Right? Your job. Like if even if you ignored every email you ever got, but you were thinking really big picture and charting the course of the company over the long term and and its values and culture and et cetera, the co- somebody else can do the other things, right? Somebody else can figure out who gets to sit over here and how do we respond to this letter from the IRS or, you know what I mean? All those things can handle themselves. But if if the guy or the woman in charge isn't thinking big picture or, or you know, finding the right inspirations, I mean, it's just not going to happen. 
I, uh, I I love those pieces of advice. And I've got a couple of bonus questions All right. for you. I All said right. one more, but I'll I kind of I, I tricked you there. That that was that was my uh, immature attempt at media manipulation because I just want to see if I could pull one over on the master <laughs> okay. of media manipulation. See, see what I did there? No. Uh, the, uh, uh, that was, by the way, for people listening who don't know, your, your first book was Trust Me, I'm Lying, which was about how to trick the media into uh, crazy stuff that was funny. Yes. Uh, so um, what's the best book you've ever read um i'm trying to look here on my shelf um you know my favorite novel is um a novel called what makes sammy run by bud schulberg um it's about this sort of super ambitious talent agent um who gets everything he ever wanted and it turns out to be the worst thing that could have ever happened to him it's a sort of interesting novel about ambition which i love uh, uh you know so much I'd probably put Robert Greene's books up there. And then obviously the, the you know, Marcus Aurelius's meditations, I think is just this uh, spectacularly unique historical document. I'm going to tell you a little story now. All right. And it has a point. Uh, so you got to bear with me for about a minute here while I tell it to you. So I, I run this, this 40 years of Zen neurofeedback thing. And we've got this, this giant, mansion it looks like xavier school for the gifted where we do brain training for executives and oh maybe 18 months ago i spent the night there there's plenty of space and it's a place where i can stay in seattle and i'm all by myself on this you know seven acre property and we have this bookshelf full of books and i'm you know it, it, i did a, a bunch of very deep meditation style work with neurofeedback like mystical state kind of stuff and i'm walking uh, to the room i'm going to go to sleep and i hear a thump and I walk out, and one of the books, for reasons I still have no idea, jumped off the shelf. It, it there's no reason, there's no mice. I I, I, I couldn't figure this out. But I, I climbed up. There's a library with one of those oh, ladders. I climbed up there. I'm like, like, what the hell? The book that fell out was Marcus Aurelius. That's incredible. And it falls open to a page, and I was like, this is creepy stuff, and like, like, what is going on, and I, you know, I took a picture of the page, I, I, I put it on my Instagram or Facebook or something, and, you know, wrote down what it said, which I don't have in my head right now, uh, and I'm like, this is, this is kind of creepy, so I go to bed, and I hear another thump, I kid you not, another Marcus Reilly's books jumps off the shelf, I cannot explain it to this day, and now, here's why I'm telling all this stuff, do you believe in mystical mumbo jumbo like that? Or well, not? maybe what happened was, uh, you know, in the movie Interstellar, where he's like behind the bookshelf and he's pushing the bookshelves to communicate a message to you. Maybe that was uh, one of the Stokes just trying to get in touch with you through that space time a, continuum. Yeah, it was a gravity lens. I, I don't know. But but the, the broader thing. Uh, uh, do you believe in mystical stuff like that? I can't tell you if I believe it or not. I can tell you that happened and it was kind of freaky, but I, I, you know, I, I can ascribe no cause or, you know, or meaning of maybe it was random. It just didn't feel well, very random. I, I don't, I, I, I'm currently and have been for some time an atheist, but I do believe that there are so many things that are currently and perhaps perpetually uh, beyond our comprehension and that effectively those uh, are some version of a higher power. So like even randomness, right? Um, randomness, it, even if it is technically random, is still s like the fact that it fell on you, right? That the books fell in your house or that the lottery number, at, you know, you pulled the lottery number at the exact moment you needed it uh, or, or whatever it is. All the uh, incredible coincidences that happen in this world, they may as well be a mystical experience because randomness is just a way of describing an experience uh, that, that attempts to explain it, but who knows, right? So I, I, I definitely believe in things beyond us. And I, I, think, I think one of the reasons to do that, even, you know, even if um, sort of a reverse version of Pascal's wager, one of, the, one of the reasons to believe in some sort of higher power or mystical experience or something beyond you is that it's inherently humbling, right? It makes you think that you're not in charge <laughs> of the universe and that there are things that remain beyond your comprehension. And I think this properly takes us down a peg. Yeah, I I, I can tell you, sometimes serendipity looks kind of cool, uh, but I, I don't have any particular insider wisdom into why or how or whether it was random or not. 
But it's always interesting uh, to ask people, especially because yeah. it made me think of it with the whole Marcus Aurelius thing, uh, just to go, you know, how common is that? And it seems like it's more common when you ask people about it than you think. But it's one of those things I ponder about and well, I have no answer. You know, for. even how you met your wife or how you had the idea for the, it's so, all of it could have so easily gone a different way, you know? And, yeah. you know, I met my wife at a party in college and I could have gotten in a car accident on the way or I could have decided not to go or I could have been sick, you know, so many or she could have been sick or we could have just not walked down a hall at the same time. You know, so many things can yeah. change the direction of your life. And I guess one of the reasons to sort of think about them and be blown away by them is that it it's just sort of it's both humbling and inspiring at the same time. Uh, very, very well put. Uh, Ryan, uh, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for the extra couple bonus questions. You've got a couple of sites that listeners should go to. One is ryanholiday.net, where you sort of collect all your good stuff. And you write about stoicism on dailystoic.com, which is a, a well-trafficked site where you've got some, some good you. stuff. Anywhere else people should go to follow you or just be in Yeah, and for doing. Daily Stoic, we do like a, a daily email about stoicism every morning. And I think it's like 150,000 people now that, that are all sort of meditating on the same stoic theme. And then I'm just at Ryan Holiday on pretty much every platform. Beautiful. Thanks again. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's show, you know what to do. Go check out some of Ryan's stuff. And I'm serious, read Perennial Seller. If you want to do something epic, you need to understand the mindset there. It's that good. And do something for Ryan or any other author, including me, um, whose works you appreciate. Go to Amazon and take 10 seconds to leave a review. We actually care about that stuff. And if you read Perennial Seller, you'll know how much angst goes into writing a book worth reading. And if it takes you 10 seconds to say thanks and you got four hours of value for reading a book in four hours, do the common courtesy of doing that. Thank you. Mm -hmm.